Hi, good day, students. This is Natalie Adams, your TFS lecturer. I'm just going to share my screen with you so that we can get started as soon as possible. So let's get going. Um, share screen. Advance, virtual background, share. Perfect. So here we have the documents. I'm going to open it. And then, yes. It's loading my documentation. I'm just going to close the top one as I don't need to see myself there. <laughs> so let's get going. Okay, so again here, last week we focused on the principles of language teaching. This week we're going to look at the curriculum documents for EFAL. So that would be English First Edition of Language. So obviously as teachers, you know that you need to understand all the documentation that comes with uh, teaching English First Edition of Language, SP, and that is going to be our discussions today. So it's going to be about the curriculum documents as well as English First uh, for English First Language, additional language. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly do a roundup of tasks. Um, uh, week one, we did the welcome and introduction. And then I also told you under that, that you're going to do the menti.com, how are you feeling um, survey. Then, um, then you also had to do for me an online tracking one. So that would have been for week one. That would be a quiz. And the quiz would be about principles of language teaching online. The closing date for that is only the 31st of March. So you still have time to complete it. Please take note for those of you who's going, who have asked me this question in the Zoom meeting last week, as well as a few, one or two questions that emailed me about this. The online tracking uh, quizzes, let, let me put it to you this way, the online tracking quizzes that you, we give you doesn't count marks. It just assists you in understand, to, to almost like understand what is actually happening in the online recording. Because once you know what's happening in the online recording, it will also be easier for you to do the assignments that comes with it. So again, doesn't count marks, but it's also important that you do it, okay? So now week two, uh, this is going to be your online tracking week two. So there's going to be another quiz too. And then that that date, um, you will find it on Canvas, the closing date there. And then obviously uh, the emphasis will be on your SS1 assignment that will be submitted on the 9th of April. I'm going to try and do a quick video possibly next week uh, on the case study, the SS1 case study, just to give you a bit of guidance on how to complete it. And then, yeah, we'll take it from there. But 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 bear with me in terms of all these new things. <laughs> Stadio is going through a lot of changes. And yes, we as lecturers have to adapt to it always so quickly. So yes, it's a, there's a few challenges, but we, we're doing okay as far as I'm concerned. So let's go on. So week one, Menti, how are you feeling? This was just a survey students. I've had one or two students that said to me they couldn't get access to this to the survey. And I said to them, ah, it's fine. Don't be bothered about it. I think it's closed by now anyway. So I wanted to know how you were feeling. And this, these were the responses on Menti. A lot of you feel excited. So I had 71 responses. A lot of you feel excited. Some of you, a lot of you feel anxious and nervous. Yes, doing things online and having to manage your own time is not easy. And also understanding Canvas can be quite challenging. But remember, you decided to register for this, to do an distance learning module. And so for that reason, you need to be up to date. So just familiarize yourself with a TEFS um, on Canvas. Understand that your quick links, your quick links uh, uh, basically is, it's also known as week one, week two, week three, week four. Also take note, students, I am not opening up all the weeks. I don't publish I publish the week. So let's say we are on week two or week three. I only open those weeks. I will not open week four, five, six, and seven. We normally call it uh, at Stadio that we publish a course. And so at currently, we, well, week one is published, week two is published, week three will be published. But we're not going to publish week four until we get to week four. 
So if you, that's just something that a few students have asked me, and I thought I'll just mention it in this uh, presentation today. So yeah, again, students, I'm always recapping, just letting you know that these are the books that you need. The one is the um, prescribed book, Learn to Teach. And then we have additional books, CAPS. There's a CAPS document. The CAPS document is actually under, oh my goodness, is it week two? There's actually the CAPS document for grade, um, for grade eight and nine has been posted under Quick Links Two. So you will find it there with a copy of it. And I told my students that attended the Zoom session last week is that when they open quick links one, two, three, four, for example, I'm just using any quick links, you need to go down the page because there are different sections within the quick links that you will have to assess. So let's say we're busy with quick links too. There will be maybe PowerPoint slides. There will be um, assessments, certain things that you have to do. You can't just open quick links too and just look at the first thing that you see. You have to scroll down and actually look at everything. Okay, so I hope you understand that part because, yeah, I was getting worried. And I think one of the students actually asked me about it and I explained it to him this way. Now, I think what you need to understand is that as teachers, in practice, so as teachers, and I know that some of you are already teachers in uh, that you are working, some of you are aspiring teachers, but in practice, it is not necessary to have a rigid division between the teaching of home and additional languages. So we're saying in practice, you can basically teach both, okay? Even though you registered for first additional or home language, you can teach both. But because it's not such a big division, but there are divisions in certain areas that you need to remember. And those divisions come when we're looking at listening and speaking, which is your first bullet there, that the, with listening and speaking, home language is much more detailed than first additional language and requires more than learning, learning from learners cognitively. Of course, as a home language person, a uh, speaker, you will obviously be more attuned with uh, first language, with uh, your home language. So there's more expected from you than a first additional language student. There's also a difference, a subtle difference when it comes to reading and viewing, okay? Although both first additional language and home languages are informative in content, so both have information in their content, in their different ways, home language is normally a lot richer so in other words, it's a little bit more abstract, a little bit more complex, whereas, well, first edition of language is more simplified. And I mean, that obviously makes sense because it's not their home language. It's the first edition of language. It's also, very, it's also slightly different when it comes to, to writing and presenting. When, it, when you look at first edition of language, presents a lot of information in a tabulated form, while home language is more descriptive, okay? So um, first edition of language might be bullets that you're gonna see, and but for home language, we would like you to write a paragraph, which I think in a way is a little bit more difficult than maybe bullet points, okay? So in line with language in education policy, using more than one language of learning and teaching supports multilingualism. Okay, so if you use if you use two languages, maybe a home language, a first edition of language, that in itself supports multilingualism, which we as lecturers totally agree with. Okay. So let's move to the next slide. So in order, this is your first, your SS1 assignment, okay? This is, it's a, bit, it's a case study assignment. I've, I've loaded the assignment already for you on Canvas, so you have access to it. You can start working on it. Um, it, 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 it is not that complex. I, well, for me, it might not be, but for you, it will be. So I said, I thought to myself, I might do a, a separate video, just a short video on the... Um, CTL, CLT case study, and then also a reflection. The second part of, of the test will be a reflection uh, assignment. And I mean, really students, all we want from you is like the basics, write something about you and use six to 700 words. Use the words because that's gonna give you the marks. 
Do you understand that? And then you must blow the picture of yourself. That's all we want. And that counts 20 marks. So make it work for yourself. I mean, don't come and write a hundred words and expect me to give you 20 out of 20. No, the assignment clearly states maybe, I think it's six to 700 words and then you must upload a picture. Follow the instructions because we have external markers and they are going to mark according to the instructions. Do you understand? So take the situation, take your SS1 assignment seriously. Work on it and don't take it for granted. Okay. So this is just a few of the questions that you're going to be asked. Where, for example, I mean, I just can briefly look at it, but they would they yeah, they talk about communicative language teaching case study assignment. And obviously, your assignment is going to be a an excerpt from a or I would the better word for me would be a little case study of what happens in a classroom situation. And then we're going to ask you questions about that. Okay. So the questions would be, for example, you're going to read the case study and they will say to you, refer to the CAPS document, you know, 2011, page 11 and 12, language teaching approaches. Then explain why the lesson excerpt should be described as text-based. Number one, and then as communicative. So in other words, what did they use, the, 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 the teacher in the classroom on the case study use that was, tech, what makes it text-based? What did she use in the classroom? And what makes it communicative? So I'm going to go, I'll, I'll do a little brief session with you about that. But, but yeah, remember uh, uh, that uh, your assignment is available. Is this one is available. So let me go to the next slide. Yes, this is also part of the communicative language teaching practices. And I think we went through this. One of the pre practices of communicative language teaching is what? I explained it to you last week, that sometimes even when I speak, I don't speak always the perfect language. I don't always use the perfect language, but you understand what I'm saying to you. The, the idea, because communicative language teaching, especially for first additional language speaker, speakers and, and if you use the communicative language teaching practices it means that you, your teachers need to reduce their talk so the first one is reducing teacher talk remember the ideal situation about communicative language teaching is that we want our learners to, to talk we don't want to talk as as teachers we need to create environments where they are going to talk in the in, in the language Okay. The second one is ensuring learner work things out for themselves. So yes, you are just going to be there as an addition, but you are going to give them exercises, activities where they are going to work things out for themselves because once they do it, they will be able to understand it. They must also be able to use questions, you know, questions and also elicitation, you know, elicit things from Questions. This is how they're going to broaden broaden the um the knowledge. Okay. You must also remember we spoke about scaffold learning, where we scaffold them, especially in the first additional language class, and especially when we're going to do communicative language teaching practices, we scaffold them. In other words, we help them. We give them opportunities. So I will start a sentence as a teacher, and then the student must answer it. Because at at the beginning, you have to scaffold them so that later on, they will then be able to work independently. Okay, so the next one that I was also talking about, you need to do, you need to use peer, group or peer work. I mean, group and peer work is wonderful because, you know, as soon as people are in a group, they start talking to each other. And remember what I said to you, the main purpose of the communicative language approach is that we want teachers to talk less and students to talk more. Okay. You need to design authentic tasks. So if you're going to take a text, for example, be something that the students can identify with, you know, something that's very in. I mean, if you talk about TikTok or uh, gaming or anything like that, that, that they can relate to. It's, it's, it's though. So when you select a task or you want a text or a visual, you know, look, that's something that they will be able to identify with. Building on prior knowledge, I cannot emphasize that enough, students. I have 
right? So many of our students come in with so such a lot of prior knowledge. As I've said, um, I think I told you uh, during week one, I had a student in my, when I was doing my school-based learning, one of the students had a poetry, a poet, she, had, she did a poem on funerals. And then she actually asked the class, who was very diverse, how they celebrate funerals in their, in their culture. And I mean, these students were, so excited to explain, you know, from from different cultures, you know, Muslim, they were Hindu students, you know, they were students from different religions that expressed this. And it was interesting and wonderful to see. Okay. You need to also have very interaction, meaning that your task shouldn't just be a listening or reading or speaking. You can have just varying interaction. You can bring in all those stars, and then you need to also look at ensuring learners are responsible for their own learning. That's also a CTL practice. Okay, so let's continue. So now we are going to look at week two. The outline for this week will be curriculum and language in the new democracy. Uh, um, we're also going to look at the NCS language curriculum. We're going to look at le language learning outcomes. We're going to look at language assessments. We're going to look at Cummins' Big and Calp theory. We're going to look at curriculum challenges. And then finally, we're going to move in forward with new curriculum. So as a new teacher, especially a new one coming in, or those are in the practice, you need to understand how the documentation works when you are a teacher in a teaching first additional language students. So what are, what's the history? Uh, what documents are needed for you to become the best teacher? So we decided that as lecturers, we want to just give you a quick brief overview, like an historical overview of what is happening in South Africa. So let's start. So this is where we're going to look at. We're going to look at language curriculum pre-1994. And so pre-1994, there were different syllabuses for different languages. Okay. English and Afrikaans had their own syllabus. So they had their own curriculum. And then African languages had a common syllabus. Okay. So you can make of that what you want to. So English, Afrikaans, and African languages were taught differently. Okay, very differently. The English curriculum emphasized personal growth, encouraging, enjoying use of language. They, they also looked at being imaginative and expressive of own ideas, which is which is lovely. I mean, poetry were taught. They said syllabus included visual film study, visual literacy, inter ad development, analyzing advertisements and cartoons. So it was a very rich. Um, syllabus. It was almost as if, you know, your students could interact and so forth. Okay. So Afrikaans and African languages use structural approach. So it was very structured. You know, it wasn't as, it wasn't, the emphasis wasn't on personal growth. It was just structured. Okay. Now, let's move further. In the 1980s, um, Afrikaans moved to personal growth approach, which means that you remember initially I said to you that Afrikaans and the African languages used a uh, structured approach, but in the 1980s, Afrikaans moved to the personal growth approach. So within their syllabus, they also now had things like um, film studies, visual literacy, uh, development, analyzing, and ad advertisements and cartoons. Okay, so curriculum role in the new constitutional democracy. So what? What? So obviously the first part was pre nineteen ninety four. Now we're going to look at nineteen ninety four, which you know now is was democratic South Africa. So in nineteen ninety four, schools curriculum needed to prepare learners to participate in the new democracy. Okay, in nineteen ninety six. Essay constitutions became law and 11 official languages needed to be recognized. So remember what happened in pre-1994. Pre-1994, English and Afrikaans and African languages were there. But as I've said, English were more for personal growth. Afrikaans and Ang Af uh, 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 African languages were more structured. But in 1980, the, um, the Afrikaans also, the syllabus changed and uh, was more uh, also for personal growth. So they brought in a lot of more creativity. But now 
after 1994, things changed. For the, in 1994, 1996, the SA constitution became law and all 11 official languages needed to be recognized, okay? Everyone had the right to receive education in official languages of their choice. That's what the government said. So this, and then in 1997, new language in education policy encouraged multilingualism and respect for all languages. So in the past, there wasn't really an emphasis on African languages, but now it seemed to be um, something that's important to the policymakers. Okay, so learners' as home languages should be developed and kept. That is one decision that was made in 1997. Then they also said learners become fluent in one additional language, and that must be additive bilingualism. So that uh, language must be added later on. So then also what happened in 1997 is that school governing bodies, SGBs, have the power to choose the language of learning and teaching. And then from grade three, learners must study in their language, language of learning and teaching and one other additional language. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So what is additive bilingualism? Remember I mentioned here that they said that you, the grade three learners must study in their language of learning and teaching and one other additional language. Okay, so now we're talking about additive bilingualism. You'll find this on page 14 and 15 in Ferreira. So the national curriculum statements has three subject statements because language can be taught at three different levels. You know that you get your home language, you get your first additional language, and then you also get your second additional language. So what is your, your home language? The home language is the language that you understand and speak. And speak. The first additional language is no knowledge of the language, but it's going to be added. Okay, so it's an addition. And the second additional language, which will sometimes be uh, official or foreign language. So there's three subject statements. For example, and this is just an example that we took to explain how this works. In the Western Cape, learners may choose to study Afrikaans, home language, English as a first additional language, and Isikosa as a second additional language. Okay, in KwaZulu Natal, however, learners may choose English as a home language and use Zulu as a first additional language, and they may you may you use um, look at Afrikaans as a second additional language. Okay, so let's move on. So this is what additive bilingualism means. It means add additive bilingualism occurs when a second language. Remember, add adds in a second language and culture have been acquired without loss or displacement of an individual's first language and culture. Positive self-concept usually develop. That's very true. Okay, so we're not taking away the first language. The first language remains. Uh, the home language remains, but we just add it. Subtractive occurs. Bilingualism, which I don't believe in, I, I hate this policy personally, occurs when an individual's first language and culture are replaced by a new language and culture, usually occurring in occurring in a pressurized context. And this is actually sometimes what happens in a lot of um, our township schools where students whose home language might be Sitosa. And then suddenly it is in grade three, suddenly they lose their home language and then it's replaced with English becomes the home language. And I mean, that's not really what we want. Okay, but let's go on. So language teaching post 1994, this is now, remember, I spoke to you a little bit about the, the history of our country. And now we're going to talk about language teaching post-1994. Our emphasis have changed. After 1994, all languages need to be needed to be treated equally. So all um, 11 official languages. I'm not sure. If, yeah. In 1997, new outcome-based curriculum was introduced with all 11 languages having the same approach. I think that was still called OBE. Maybe some of you might remember that. Outcomes-based education. And then all learning areas share seven general or critical outcomes. And these will be, those, these outcomes you'll find in the CAPS document 1.3.D. Okay, 
Okay, so if you want to go and look. So all learning areas, she has seven general or critical outcomes and so forth. So let's move to the next one. So these are the general aims for learners. These are the critical outcomes that I've just mentioned from the previous slide. Number one, learners must be able to solve problems and make decisions using critical and creative thinking. Number two is they must be able to work as a team, group, organization, and community members. Number Another one would be they need to organize and manage themselves and act activities responsibly and effectively. Then they also need to collect. They must be able to analyze, so collect information, analyze the information, organize the information, and critically evaluate information. Okay. The community, they need to communicate effectively using, using visual, symbolic, and or language skills in various modes. They must also use signs and technology effectively and critically, showing responsibility towards environments and health of others. They must also be able to demonstrate world understanding as a related set of systems as problem-solving contexts do not exist in isolation. So they must demonstrate world understanding as related to a set of symbols as problem solving contexts do not exist in isolation. They need to know things from a broad spectrum, okay, because isolation just some, simply does not work. So these were the general aims for learners. And then, yeah, I just took um, this from Anderson. And Scrathwell, I'm not even knowing whether I'm abusing that name, 2001, he says that learners must be able to remember uh, what they've learned. They must be able to understand what they've learned. They must be able to apply what they've learned. They must be able to analyze what they've learned. They must be able to evaluate what they've learned. And they must eventually create what they've learned. And if this is also part of Bloom's sticks up with, taxonomy, I think, and these are what our learners should be looking at. So they must be able to put on their thinking cap, they must be able to look at a problem, they must be able to critically think about a problem, and they must also be able to solve the problem. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So then, so obviously there's this national curriculum statements. So firstly, we talked about, um, you know, the history, <laughs> the history of, of education and language teaching in South Africa. So number two is going to be about the documentation that's needed. So this will be your national curriculum statements, the documents. So in 2002, there was national curriculum statements for grade nines came out. In 2003, the national curriculum statements for grade 10 and 12 um, was, um, what is the word I'm looking for, was published. <laughs> And that would be for the FET levels. And then the national curriculum statement provide also the learning outcomes for the curriculum. That's their responsibility. What our learners need to know. You know what's a learning outcome. So the one when you're done with grade 12, this is the learning outcomes that we want. Okay. There are four documents for students, for teachers that they need to know about. They need to know the national curriculum statements from grade R to grade 12. They need to know the curriculum and assessment policy statements, CAPS. They also need to know the learning and teaching support material that is needed. And they also need to know the national protocol for assessments from grade 12 to R to grade 12. And we will find all of this curriculum and policy documents on the website here, www.education.gov.za. Um, uh, Sorry, I just... And so if you go to years, just a picture of where you can find all these things, it's there for you. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Then the, there is also national curriculum statements, learning outcomes for languages from grade R to grade nine. And these are these. Um, I said to you for listening and speaking. Yeah, we, for listening, speaking, the outcomes from grade R to grade nine would be information and enjoyment of a range of contexts. So that, remember I told you last week that that will be for semester one. A reading and reviewing will be for semester one. And then semester two, we're going to focus on writing and presenting. And then we'll also focus on language structures and conventions. So these are the learning outcomes from grade R 
to grade nine, okay? So we want to look at listening and speaking, reading and viewing semester one. During semester two, it's gonna be writing and presenting and language structures and conventions. So let's go to the next slide. So our learning outcomes for uh, languages for FETs, grade 10 to 12, it's here, but this is not really for you. So I'm just gonna continue to the next page. You are not doing FET, you're doing SP. Now, if you're looking at the national curriculum statement, the task, check national curriculum statements for grades R to grade 12 for the languages you teach. So that would be maybe English and compare learning outcomes and assessments for first edition of language, FET and SP for selected grades. So obviously the learning outcomes will be different because for, for, for first edition, even for first edition of language, SP students, as well as first edition of language, FET students, because it's different grades. Okay? So are there any similarity, differences, similarities? They will definitely be similarities, but there will also be a few differences. What is the reason for the differences and similarities? I mean, one of the basic differences would be that if you are in an FET class, you would, you, you would, you, you would, your knowledge will, would have been developed more co cognitively. So there will be those uh, changes that you need to be considerate about. So the language uh, learning outcomes and CAPS activity. Okay, so yeah, they're just saying compare learning outcomes for grades eight to nine and grades 10 and 12. You can go do that. The CAPS documents are there. You can have a look at that. Then language assessments. Okay, so what have we done so far? We have done uh, a bit of a history of South Africa in terms of our democracy pre-1994, so pre post-1994. Post I think number two was that we looked at the national curriculum statements. We also then look at the learning outcomes for languages. And now we're going to look at language assessments. And so how are we supposed to assess language? That's also given to us. Okay, so CAPS does not describe assessment as standard reference. However, mandated systems of recording and reporting learn achievements has many similarities with standard reference assessments. And I'm going to give you an idea of what I mean there. Learner achievement is reported on a scale that shows seven levels of possible achievements and learners are not placed in rank order. So task, check this assigned assessments for listening and speaking for grade eight nine or 10 and 11. So this is, I'm sure you, you, if you have children, this is what you have seen. You know, when they've achieved, th this is what comes from the Department of Education, when they've received, received um, uh, 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 an outstanding achievement, you will see that there's a rating code of seven, and that means that the person achieved between 80 and 100%. And obviously, if it's one, you have the rating code is one, not achieved, the, you have the learner achieved between zero and 29%. Okay. So let's, and this is also just another one where, where it is clear in caps what they mean with orals will be internally set, internally assessed, and externally moderated. It's very clear how we have to go about when it comes to oral presentation. This will be in your CAPS document, so prepared speech will for be will be assessed. There must be research skill, planning, organization of content. If you're doing a presentation, we need to look at the tone. We need to look at speaking and presentation skills. We need to look at the critical awareness of language use, choice design, and or use audio and visual aids. If the person use audio or visual aid and so forth. So this is just information that the teacher needs to know about. And so now we're gonna look at number five, which will be Cummins's principle about Bix and Cup. Now Cummins is a theorist who came out and he said that, and he talked about Cummins's language teaching and language learning principles. And this you'll find on page 51 in the Ferreira book. And he says, an English language teacher's like this picture because, can you see there, it's like a, um, here you can see that uh, you have a, um, how can I get to the word? I think I'm getting tired. Um, so here we have a, what I, 
iceberg, okay? And you can see the top section we can see, okay? And then obviously most of it is at the bottom. Now, what Cummins is saying that students, most students have BICs. So what is BICs? BICs is what they call interpersonal communication skills. So that's bottom level skills, okay? And at the bottom of the scale, which is CALP, a lot of students do not have the cognitive academic language proficiency skills. And that skill is needed if you want to uh, achieve in life. Okay, so let's go further. So this is his theory, an iceberg. So Jim Scammons defined Bix and Kelp. Okay, so this is what they're saying. Bix, can you see there? There we have Bix on top. If you could look at the picture on top, it's again, that picture shows you the um that Bix is, is you, it's surface level learning and kelp is the actual academic learning. So Bix will be social skill learning. So what comes is you differentiate between the social language, which is Bix, and academic language, which is scalp. So English second language students acquire Bix rather quickly. So the social skills they acquire very, very quickly, but the academic, you know, by being able to think critically, uh, abstract thoughts, complexities in language, you know, that they struggle with. And that is what Bix is. In order for you to, to become a successful student, you need to have not just the basic interpersonal communication skills, but you also need the cognitive academic proficiency skills, language proficiency skills. So let's go further. So the second language acquisition model, this is Cummins' model. And he says, here we have an iceberg analogy. And he says that it's important of having both. You're the first language and the second language to develop language proficiency. So if you have your first language on top of the iceberg, that's good. And you have your second language on top of the iceberg, this will then assist you in becoming a better speaker or so this is what uh, Cummins is saying you get two types of learning you get a context embedded and then you get a context renews re uh, reduced um uh knowledge okay so what is a com context embedded Acquisition. So acquisition of a language depends on clues given. Okay. So a context embedded uses concrete clues outside language to make sense. For example, nonverbal cues. So they use a lot of big basic interpersonal communication skills, very basic skills. So this is context embedded. You know, it's it's basically those very easy were easy sentences or easy teach educational. Uh, exercises that you are given. And that is what developed Bix. But Cummins then says what we want is what they call context reduced activity. So context reduced is abstract and relies on language for sense. For example, an article on economic regression depends on the language knowledge. That means cow. So you can have Bix, but that's more of a social skill, you know, when it comes to language, when it comes to difficult, complex uh, understanding of a text, you need to have context reduced activities, because once you have context re uh, reduced activities, where the learner actually have to think about what is expected from them, then, then it means that they are busy developing Okay, so we want count and not necessarily be big. So for these, for teachers, what you need to do is to design cognitive demanding, deep thinking activities, not these very basic activities. Do and try, even when using big. So you must try and not give activities that's not challenging to the students. I mean, that can happen very easily. Uh, where, as I've said, you can give them isolated sentences um, and then they just have to say whether it is a simple present tense or a simple past tense. Or you can give them a, an activity on the present simple tense or the present past tense, um, and, but then it will be a little bit more complex, okay?
So the iceberg here would be a cognitive process, okay? So BICS will focus on vocabulary, pronunciation, and grammar, whereas KELP then is more focused on analysis, okay? And then also about synthesis and then evaluation. So let's go to the next one. So design challenging interactional activities and scaffold, you know, abstract academic tasks. For example, don't just focus, for example, just on remembering and understanding. Really start focusing on the applying, analyzing, because evaluate and create Bloom's taxonomy, where the students will have to think about deeper thinking rather than just about remembering and understanding. Okay, so improve teaching and learning and language learning. All students learn better when academic content in language objectives are clearly explained. So the student needs to know what they should be doing. Okay, explanations and expectations for academic tasks are modeled and clear. So um, I, I have a when I was an English teacher at school, one of the things that I always did, especially when I wanted them to do a presentation for me, is that I would do a presentation. I would model it exactly more or less how I would have expected it from them. Because sometimes it's difficult for them to understand the concept. So I would become one of the learners and sometimes just model it for them so that they could have an idea. So I'm scaffolding the entire process. Okay. So explanation and expectations for academic, academic tasks are modeled and clear. Visuals, graphics, and supplementary material are used. Okay, so there's a lot of visuals. You're not just going to go in there with a textbook. Guys, you need to use these visuals. There are so many out there to assist our students. So you need to use visuals and graphics and supplementary materials okay, are used. It, it, it makes it so much easier. I mean, I remember also one of my students, school-based learning students, they were, there was a bell, she, she, one of the, the um, it was a novel, and she wanted to show the difference in the sounds of different bells. I think she just brought in, you know, I suppose she went to YouTube or somewhere and, and the students could immediately know, in, could I immediately identify when the bell was for someone who had passed away, when it was for a wedding, when it was for going to church in the morning. It was beautiful to see. And I mean, that just that sound made a huge difference. Okay, so opportunities for hands-on learning and inquiring, you know, task-based interaction and discussions in cooperative groups. So that's also very task-based interactions. So it must have a task with it. And discussions must also be there. Thinking and learning strat strategies are explicitly modeled. You know, there's no confusion. Students can build on their background experiences. They come in with so much prior knowledge and we must make use of it. Knowledge, they come in with background experiences. They come in with knowledge and strengths. They have key vocabulary, they must have key vocabulary and concepts are emphasized, okay? Let's go further. So for example, here's a challenge that you are giving the students. Um, and I just said good learners go into the pit. <laughs> so the first time have a go, they're going to say, I don't get it when they see an assignment. And then the next one will go, it's too hard. And then, oh, hmm. Then they start thinking, hmm, how can I do this? And then they think, ah, there's a shark at the bottom. So how can I get to the other side without the shark eating me? And then eventually realize that they can crawl over something. And then they go, I think I can do this. Okay, since I can do this, what else can I try now? Then I'll try again. Who can help me? I'm getting there. And then Eureka, I have done it. That's the type of... Uh, teaching that we want in our classes. So let's go further. So recognizing Bix and Kelp, and you know what Bix is, Bix is your common theory, basic interpersonal communication skills, and Kelp is your cognitive academic language proficiency skills in the classroom, and there they speak about Ferreira 2009, page 52. Offer Mrs. Wallace an explanation. So that if you go to that, you can offer Mrs. Wallace an explanation for Kulani's current performance in English. 
consider the difference between his oral and written performance and reflect on his poor performance on written tasks that have a strict time limit. So if you go to that article, you will see that uh, Kalani is very good when it comes to uh, Bix. He is very good in the basic interpersonal communication skills, but not in Calc. And that really is what the, what the article is all about. Okay, so here's the active reading, recognizing bigs and calp in a, in a classroom. Okay, and this is the explanation. You can go to the textbook there and you will find it. And I mean, there, there it explains to you the difference between bigs and calp. We're almost done. So what's the new curriculum challenges? What is the new curriculum challenges? Teachers must be able to, this is what they need to do, interpret learning outcomes and design activities to implement them. They can't just sit there and expect it. They must design activities to implement them, interesting activities, okay? They must think about activity sequencing and combining. How can they move from one activity to the next, to the next one? How can they combine different learning outcomes? For example, how can they combine reading, listening, writing, and speaking? Like, uh, as, as a way of looking at it. So they also need to design lesson units around themes or text types. Okay, so we, you, a, a unit, a lesson unit is normally about one thing and then you teach about different things within the one text and then how to design that. And then also how to design a variety of assessments maybe from one unit. Okay, so assessments would be uh, the the activities, the exams, et cetera, that they're going to do at school. This is what you need to, 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 to do. You know, you need to include media literacy, film studies, and critical language awareness. Remember I said to you that those are uh, the tasks, you know, initially English language, uh, the English language was given that, and that was for personal development. And that was even pre-1994. So if you can do this in your classes for the first edition of language students, it will also have the same effect, you know, that to include media literacy, film studies, and critical language awareness. Should these aspects be included in the national curriculum statements for African languages? Of course. I mean, that should not even be a question that we should ask at this in this day and age. How can more texts be made available in African languages? I mean, goodness me, promoting it, promoting it, encouraging the writing of African languages, making, uh, buying books, you know, uh, marketing, branding African language writers. That's how you're going to be able to make more texts available. Okay. So here is an example of how you can use texts again, you know, in, in order to make your 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 um your classes exciting, et cetera, et cetera, especially looking at kelp. And then yeah, we just I'm not sure whether you are aware of the FUNSA reading material. So this is where you can just find interesting you know, reading material, especially on African languages. So if you have time, please go there. So with what is the way ahead? This is the last one with a new curriculum. Teachers need to take personal responsibility for making sense of the new curriculum and putting it into practice. Yes, people, teach you it's your responsibility. Yes, you do get a textbook, I understand, and there are other resources available, but they, you must look at your context and say, does this make sense? How can I change it so that my students will be, much, sorry, that my learners can be more interested in it, okay? Am I just teach teaching them bigs um am i am i not supposed to bring in a little bit more of kelp you know am i allowing my learners to be critical thinkers etc cetera, etc cetera. so take personal responsibility for making sense of the new curriculum and putting it into practice share and discuss teaching practices more i think that's so important i mean i've been in the world of teaching in many spheres very different totally different areas and 
I always get excited when I have I, I discover a new teaching practice that I might not have known about before because I think my motto in life has always been that learning is a lifelong experience. And so I would never want to stop learning. No one can ever say to me that, well, I know enough. No, there's always going to be new trends. I mean, 20 years ago, we did not know that um, the internet I was actually speaking to someone and I said, goodness me, I didn't even, we didn't even know that TikTok would exist uh, five years in. And now it's something that's so popular, you know? So yes, it's things change. You need to be able to keep updated. You need to look at a variety of textbooks. For example, how to design a program of learning. Don't just use one textbook. Look at other things that other people are doing as well. Also then, Bring in your own texts, as I've said, to make it exciting. And you need to read and view how other teachers teach more. That's it. Okay. So I think we're almost done. So now we're going to look at language acquisition for the next one, the next session. Yes, students. <laughs> this is the end of my talk. And hopefully you'll be able to listen to this. And then I'll start the second language acquisition soon. Okay. Take care. Bye.